right. So we are ready for the, for the biggest and best and maybe the most exciting part of our program tonight. We're really honored to have uh, this group with us tonight to uh, give us their blunt tell-all from the campaign trail, political parties in the next generation. So probably nobody here might need introduction, but I'll begin with the executive editor of the Texas Tribune, Mr. Ross Ramsey, who's going to moderate our panel this evening. And we're joined by Steve Munisteri, who's, of course, chairman of the Republican Party in Texas, and Mr. Gilberto Hinojosa, who's the chairman of the Texas Democratic Party. And we also have Carrie Christman, who's here uh, as the executive director of Red State Women. And finally, Christine Sanders, who's uh, joining us as the state director for the Texas League of Young Voters. So please join me in welcoming our panel. I can give you a 30 second one. That's fine too. <laughs> uh, we lost because our base didn't turn out. Why not? You spent how much money? I think there's a lot of around? reason that, now that's a 30 minute rent response, but I, but I can tell you, I think primarily it, it, it I mean, if you look at the numbers, um, and we haven't finished uh, analyzing them completely, um, uh, uh, Greg Abbott got the same number of votes that Rick Perry got uh, in 2010. Um, what happened was that Wendy Davis got 300,000 votes less. If you take a look at the total number of votes in that election for uh, governor, there was 300,000 less people that voted this time around. The percentage of voting turnout in the state of Texas in 2014 dropped uh, five, uh, at least five percentage points. Uh, we went from... Uh, the lowest voter turnout state, I believe, in the country to the lowest, lowest voter turnout state in the country. And I think it's safe to say that that 300,000 that didn't turn out were prob pro probably primarily Hispanic voters um, for whatever reason didn't turn out to vote. We think that a large part of the reason was, um, you know, this voter ID bill and the voter suppression legislation that has been passed by the Republican Party. I mean, if you if, if, if you look at the total number of people who were registered to vote um, who uh, w did not have IDs under the opinion that was written by the federal district judge in, in Corpus Christi, uh, it, and this is information that we got from the Republican right. Party, it was 500,000 voters uh, that uh, had, uh, were voter registered to vote uh, and, uh, and did not have IDs. So if you see the outcome of this election, I think that's really what ended up happening. On top of all of that, I think that, you know, the same mood in this country that was going on, not just in Texas, but all across the United States, with people being disinterested in this election for a variety of re reasons, hit us here in Texas, and, it, and especially with Hispanic voters. I mean, a lot of Hispanic voters were down on what had happened with respect to immigration reform. They had not, the promises that were made to them were not fulfilled. Um, and they were very disappointed, and I, I believe a lot had, of them stayed home because of that. If you had had those 300,000 voters who disappeared from 2010 to 2014, you still wouldn't have closed That's the gap. Right. That's exactly right. But, so but, are you just in an impenetrably red state here? No, I don't think that's true. I think that, look, there's 2 million Hispanics in the state of Texas that are U.S. citizens um, and over the age of 18 that are not registered to vote. There's about 1.6 million uh, Hispanics in the state of Texas that are registered to vote that don't vote. That's 3.6 million Hispanics in Texas that are not voting today. Um, under normal circumstances, and I know Steve is going to talk about this in just a second, but under normal circumstances, Texans, uh, Hispanics in, in, in Texas, just as they do across the United States, when they vote, 70% of the time they vote for uh, Democrats. And this because the number of Hispanics participating in this election probably decreased substantially. If you, if you look at the total universe of Hispanics that are voting, obviously the Republican uh, Party got more percentage-wise, more votes from Hispanics than they have in the past because you had fewer number of Hispanics participating in this election. But the total number is probably the same as it, as it, it was in 2010. I mean, until our base, which are primarily Hispanics uh, that are not voting, starts to perform during elections, we're going to continue to have this problem. And this is something that the Democratic Party has got to sit down and figure out how to fix. Until then, we're not going to be able to turn this state blue. Okay, let me roll down my forensics panel here. 
Ms. Krista. Absolutely. You, um, you know, we take a different perspective, Ross. Um, we really? like to look at it from a female perspective. <laughs> And um, particularly from uh, representing a political action committee here to speak on behalf of Republican women. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you look at what happened yesterday, I think it's really a culmination. And, and you, you look at it from the beginning. When Wendy Davis first launched her bid for um, governor, you see that um, she launched it based on political stardom on one issue. And we saw that same theme run through the entire cycle of the campaign. And I think they seriously miscalculated um, the female vote. To be honest with you, when you look at the suburban vote and you look at the, um, the counties that turned out the most and the most females and, um, and they were highly Republican, you're looking at Denton and, and um, Collin and Williamson County. These are Fort Bend County. These are counties that are red and registrations were high in those areas. So even though registration didn't keep pace with um, the voter age population, it did increase in these red counties, which really hurt them in the long run. So I think it was a culmination of uh, lack of message on her part and the Democrat part. Um, I think that they stuck to wedge issues that were an attempt to divide and divide, define women. And I don't think any woman appreciates that. I think uh, we're interested in a, a broad range of issues, um, including the economy and security and education. And I think they were never able to define themselves outside of you know, these wedge issues like equal pay and abortion and contraception. Those are things that, um, while people have a personal opinion about them, uh -huh. don't necessarily rank number one um, on their issue when they go to the polls. Do you think those were persuadable voters? I don't. Okay. Well, there's about 30 reasons why we did well, most of which we, uh, Chairman Hinojosa and I uh, talked. Just cherry pick through. Yeah, I will. <laughs> Uh, but my point was going to be, I, I said before the election why they, and the word I used for the Houston Chronicle a couple of weeks ago is I said the Democrats are about to have a ca catastrophic failure. And one of the reasons is, and Chairman Hinojosa alluded to the fact I was going to talk about some statistics, is he and I talked about a month ago. And he used the same statistic he used today. He said Democrats are going to get 70 percent of the Hispanic vote. And I just said, Chairman, you're wrong. We, we will get over 40 percent of the Hispanic vote. We've been getting over 40 percent of the Hispanic vote. So I checked the CNN exit polls today, and you might be surprised to find that John Cornyn won the Hispanic vote yesterday. And if you look among Hispanic males, Greg Abbott won the Hispanic vote yesterday. Among Hispanic males. I mean, Hispanic males. He got 42% overall, which was north of the 40% that I predicted when the last time the chairman and I visited. But so, just think about this. John Cornyn got more Hispanic voters than his opponent, which means, and I said at the time, as the state becomes more Hispanic, it's now going to become more Republican, because I said we'll get north of 40% this election, and we're pretty confident we're on our way to over 50%. And that's in line with what, how we've performed over the last 20 years. In 1998, uh, the party got 49% of the Hispanic vote. In 2000, we got 49% of the Hispanic vote. In 2004, we got 49% of the Hispanic vote. And what did John Cornyn get yesterday? 48% of the Hispanic vote. So I th find this, this analysis by Chairman Hinojosa pretty interesting. He said, well, the wrong kind of Hispanics turned out because it was a smaller group. I don't know where he gets that from. What, we're getting the same amount of Hispanic support that we've gotten traditionally. And I also said, and I've been saying for a year, that the Democrats made a huge mistake, and their number one mistake is they pay attention to gender and ethnic demographics, and they don't pay any attention to ideological demographics, because the UT Texas Tribune poll showed that only 20% of the people in the state considered themselves liberal, 48% considered them conservatives, and 52% considered themselves moderate. It's even more pronounced among Hispanics. 40% of Hispanics considered themselves conservative in Texas. 18% considered themselves liberal. There was a great article in the February, 2000, uh, February 9, 2014 by Gallup that concluded that Texas Hispanic voters were far more conservative uh, than the rest of the country, and they pointed out that support for Hispanics in the Democratic Party has slipped considerably over the last five years. If you went back five years ago, 53% of Hispanics in the state considered them Democratic. Today, or in February 2014, it was 46%. And I said, the Democrats are making a huge mistake. They are picking a candidate who will not do well in the Hispanic community. I said that before the primary, when Wendy Davis lost 21% of the vote in a primary against a no-name. And if you look at the counties that she lost, she lost Hispanic counties. Now, for the last four years, 
The Republican Party's number one mission has been to get as close as we can to 50 percent more of the Hispanic vote. And I don't think there was a recognition by the Democratic Party just how much gains we had. We had nine full-time Hispanic Republicans fluent in Spanish, working in the neighborhoods, staying in the neighborhoods. We targeted over a million Hispanic families that were conservative. Uh, and we've been work. We've been going to every group we can think of, even Democratic-leaning groups like LULAC, et cetera. We send representatives, and we built a huge mailing list of, of Hispanics, and we engage them. So, splitting the Hispanic vote, and John Cornyn. Let me repeat that. John Cornyn won the Latino vote yesterday, was a huge factor. Uh, they're not paying attention to ideological demographics was a huge factor. And then I'll add a third factor, which is for a year and a half we've been working very hard on a ground game, and we we started a year and a half ago. So while the other side put out press releases and said they made so many calls and they had so many knocks, we were just laughing to ourselves because, like, we were making a million calls per week with volunteers, not with paid staff. We just didn't put out uh, and I would, any press releases on it. And I will finally say a huge thank you to Battleground Texas because we never could have done this without their help. Uh, they were the best boogeyman a party could ever want <coughs> because we fired up our base like we've never fired them up. So they were the first paragraph of your fundraising letters? So? All the time. Yeah. First paragraph of our speeches, watch all the elected officials. Uh, we just kept saying, you know, they're down here, they're going to try to turn the state democratic. And they really, really helped us. Um, they helped us raise money, they helped us energize our base. And they also helped us by spreading the democratic message because what, one of the things you have to remember is if you have people going door to door, if they have the wrong product, if they're advertising the wrong product, all you're doing is helping us. And finally, I'll just make one final point. Finals? <laughs> I'll gonna, make, is anybody else going to speak here? I'll make, well, one, one final point. Well, as I said, you could, you could talk for hours on all yeah, the things well. they did wrong. Now, you did, you all did lose by 20 points yesterday after you all said you were going to win. Um, they... I got calls as the chairman of the Republican Party of Texas from Wendy Davis people. My mother, who never uh, has voted Democratic, has been involved since 1948. The Tarrant County headquarters got calls. Th that's just telling me that people are not targeting correctly. The Republican Party spent zero time talking to Republicans or Democrats prior to get out the vote. We completely ignored everybody who voted in our primary. We completely ignored everybody who voted in the Democratic primary. We spent the last year and a half only talking to swing voters, and we won the swing voters overwhelmingly. Swing voters. People who sometimes vote Democratic, sometimes vote Republican. But if they're not voting in primaries, how do you know? Because we were going door to door with survey information, asking people uh, how they vote generally in, in the general election. So for example, on the early vote by mail, the normal universe of seniors over, uh, who vote Republican in the primary are 500,000. But we had, a, we had a list of 1.2 million seniors that said that they were going to vote Republican after we identified them as swing voters, et cetera, and helped persuade them to be Republican. So there's 700,000 names that don't vote in the primary, and we do that all across the state. I mean, there, there's a reason why we won by historic percentages. The entire ticket one by 20 percent or more, uh, with the exception of Dan Patrick, who did 19 and a half percent. Ms. Sanders, what do you think? Of? Yeah, I don't. I think um, I think that it's 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 not dead. It's a process, Ross. I mean, it, Texas didn't get like this overnight, and it's not going to happen overnight. I mean, we we can't drive through and have changes. We have to work, and it takes time. Um, and I think that 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 what happened yesterday is it's, it's a, it, there are many lessons to learn. There was a lot of things that Turn Texas Flu did, but I think that they started from scratch versus connecting to some of the already established groups that were on the ground. Um, so it was them running field versus them connecting and coming to just be backup or, or extra forces uh, for the ground. And I think that that was a, a challenge for the campaign, but I think also young people. Um, there weren't real conversations that dug deep into the issues. You know, there was lawsuits, there was, you know, there were issues, but there, there weren't conversations that were really talking about deregulation, college tuition, the cost of books. These are things that could potentially have generations of young people, even with financial assistance, not able to go to college in the state of Texas. And, and nobody was talking about that. And I think um, ignoring the youth vote is, um, it was something that was a, a big mistake. Uh, they should have extremely been targeted. And I think also um, the 
conservatives are showing that they do know that this is not a red state with the voter ID law. Um, in the 2000, um, in the Bill White, Rick Perry election, there was about 600,000 votes that separated the two, 600,000. That Texas voter ID law was not about an ID. They cherry picked and the federal court came out with Texas's numbers, 600,000 would be disenfranchised. I think that, I think that the, the thing that happened yesterday was, or the results of yesterday were, there's a lot of lessons to learn, but I say ultimately this is a process. And I think conservatives know more. The boogeyman, you're only scared if it, there's truth involved. Um, and I think that, that it's just a process. And I think that there's a lot of learning, but also um, not giving up and kind of focusing and, and being really strategic but hitting the goal. I'm, I'm curious about the, this youth vote. And, I, and I'm curious about, you know, one of the numbers that really struck me in the election was that the state got bigger in the last four years. The voter rolls got bigger in the last four years. 300,000 fewer people voted. Um, the baseline number in 2010 was not great. I think we were first in the worst list in 2010 for turnout. Continue to be the worst. This is turning into a niche game, politics in Texas. Um, you know, fewer than 35% fewer than of Texans vote. What gets people to turn out? What's gonna turn that around? And do you guys wanna turn it around? Is that yeah. something that's, well, that's of interest to the parties? It doesn't seem to be well, it is for us. I mean, look, I, you know, I, this is, I, I get, uh, it, it, it astonishes me that, um, that on the one hand, the Republican chairman says that they've been trying to attract uh, Hispanic voters into the Republican Party, and on the other hand, they pass a voter ID bill that is designed specifically to suppress a Hispanic vote. We, we had a debate with the Texas Tribune uh, about um, six weeks ago, a couple of months ago, and I asked Steve Munster, I said, will you join me in calling the Secretary of State to um, enforce the law that requires high school principals to register all the students over the age of 18? And he said yes, yet he wasn't really willing to sign a letter to the Secretary of State. Now, no, no, now Garberto, hold on, let me finish. I, did, I, did, I didn't interrupt you. I let did, me finish. I let me call. finish, okay? I just want to I, sign it. I will, we, no. We, you did not want to sign it, Steve. And the reason call. you didn't want to sign it, because in the Texas high schools today, the great majority of high school students that are turning over the age of 18 are what? Hispanic and African American. And if you register those people to vote, they're more than likely going to vote for Democrats. Now, why would you want to disenfranchise? Hey, hey, but Ross, could I answer wait, something wait, specific wait, on that? Let me, let me ask you something. But because the, the chairman didn't, let me ask you did not return of any of our calls. Went up this time. The number of voters went down. Right. But if you tie but that. It's not to, just Hispanic. Yeah, it's what, not just voter ID. Right, well, white voters went down. In fact, we did a chart that. Uh, Number of Democratic votes went down 280,000. Of the 300,000 votes that disappeared, 280,000 of them looked like they came from the Democrats. A smaller yeah. number from when the you Republicans. In, when What's you don't it? encourage people to vote, when you make it more difficult to vote, when you try to suppress vote, people know that and they don't participate in the electoral process. Look, you know, you talk about who was with who. I think the CNN reported this morning that, peop that Wendy Davis got more votes from people under the age of 45 than Greg Abbott did. What does that tell us? That tells us that it, if you're looking to make sure that you put yourself in the best, and they also, it also said that- They have those numbers. Huh? Actually have those numbers. 18 to 29 year olds, Abbott 49%, Davis 50%, 30 to 44 year olds, 48 to 51%. Relatively. So pretty, pretty tight. Yeah. Ross, could I answer a specific thing about the chairman. What, what the chairman's alluding to is he brought a letter that he asked me to sign to ask principals to, to publicize, uh, the Secretary of State to ask principals to s publicize young people uh, to vote to be registered at high schools. I would said publicly, I'd be happy to call the Secretary of State with you to find out what they're doing, but I'm not going to sign a letter because it presupposes the Secretary of State uh, hasn't done anything. In fact, I called Chairman Hinojosa's office not once, not twice, not three times, but four times to see if they would get on the phone with us to talk to the Secretary of State. Never heard back from them. Then what, what I did was, and talked to Will Haler, we left him messages as well. We then called the Secretary of State's office, I bet they didn't do that, had a conversation with the Secretary of State's office and found out that they had sent letters already to the principals instructing them to do that. Now let's talk about voter ID for a second. The figure they use of 500,000 people that don't have IDs, 
that are registered to vote is taken by doing a cross match on your database between people that are registered to vote and the IDs. I'm not a tech person, but this is what the tech people tell me. So when the, when the government finds out everybody who has an ID and they cross match it with the voter list, it comes up a half a million. But what my tech people tell me is that there's any deviation at all. For example, if you have Stephen P. Munisteri on one and Stephen Munisteri on the other, it's not going to show up as a match. So first of all, the 500,000 figures in doubt. Second, anybody over the age of 65 does not need a voter ID. You can simply, you can simply mail in a ballot. So that reduces that number even further. In addition to that, the Department of Public Safety established 220 offices, many of which were open on Saturday for the sole purpose of giving out free IDs. In 46 cities, they had mobile units to give people free IDs, and it was so easy that the Democratic websites, if you went to them, they eventually took it down when we commented on this, had a little notes about how easy it is to get your ID. Now, after all that, there were 2,100 people that called the DPS to inquire about IDs, of which about 400 of them got IDs, and most of the rest of them, it turned out, they found out they didn't need IDs because they were over 65 or they're going to get it a different way. Even if you took that 500,000 number, which I think is completely bogus, and you assumed that 100 percent of those people that got IDs would register to vote, and 100,000 of them 100% of them would turn out to vote, and 100% of them would vote Democratic, the Democratic Party would have still lost by hundreds and hundreds of thousands of votes. So, so, so let me ask a question here, and I'll start, with, I'll start away from the chairman for just a second. Um, why are young people not voting? Is it just a hard fact in Texas, I guess in other places too, but is it just a hard fact that people that are below a certain age, unless there's something specific on the ballot, don't vote? I started voting in college because we were trying to turn Denton wet at the time. It was very important to us. <laughs> I mean, it was an issue. You could actually go vote and change your life, right? Uh, maybe for the better, maybe not, but, you know, we had a stake. But what I think that's key, Ross. I mean, that even though we laugh, I think it's key. You've got to find what moves people to the polls. And one of the things we've done at Red State Women is talk about what is going to move more females to the polls. And we want to talk to all women across the state of Texas, not just Republican women, because we believe it's important to also talk to Democrat women, um, swing voters that are also women that have gone you know, both Democrat and Republican because they haven't been able to make their mind up. And I think there's a reason behind that. And it's usually, if you look at it, um, it's usually based on candidates. And so we've seen that in the gubernatorial election. We've seen um, a, an appeal. You know, who's, who's genuine? Who's going to be a genuine leader and present an idea and ideas that are going to be the future of Texas? Something that's positive. And I think people get, um, get tired of the same old, um, you know, rhetoric and, um, you know, attacking us on voter ID when we simply want to make sure that um, people um, are who they say they are and that, you know, a vote really means one vote. And so I don't think, um, and, and you may laugh, but this is important to a lot of Texans. But in a, in a bigger sense, isn't what you just but said, I, a, hold on a second, isn't that a version of talking, picking up that same old fight? I mean, you're picking up your no, side I'm of it. No, I'm saying that that's what they're fighting. Up. You know, at Red State Women, we're not talking about voter ID. I mean, it's the law of the land. We believe in it, but we don't believe it's, you know, something that we need to talk about right now. What we're talking about is what makes Greg Abbott different than Wendy Davis. Right. And one of the things we focused on is taking testimonial videos and sharing personal stories from women as to why they are Republican, why do they vote Republican, what moves them um, to vote Republican. And I think by sharing each of their individual stories, women can connect to that. Do you think that increases I, turnout over time? I do. I do. I think we have to message differently. We can't do things the same way. And we're not going to be able to accomplish that through sound bites. We're not going to be able to accomplish that through um, mailers. It's just, it's, it's a different day to day. And, you know, listening to Harris Media and Battleground Texas. I mean, both parties are, are trying to accomplish that. They're, they're speaking to voters online. That's where we are. And women are socializing. They're socializing online. They're working online. And we've got to meet them where they are. And, you know, I, I tell my, um, you know, my friends this all the time. When you're shopping online, I'd be looking for a purse, yet then there's a, you know, Dan Patrick ad that pops up for me or a, a Greg Abbott. So, I mean, it works and it follows you around and you get the message. And, and I think that you have to just be really intentional about what that message is. And um, the more we talk to women voters and find out what moves them, the better we'll get and the more numbers will increase for our party. Ms. Sanders, what do you think about this? You know, first, let's be very clear about voter ID. 
Voter ID was a solution for a problem that did not even exist. So we can argue about the 600,000 figure, the 2.4 people that would be impacted that the Chronicle talked about early on. But voter ID was a piece of legislation pushed through the Texas legislature and signed as emergency legislation by Governor Perry for a, for a problem that didn't exist. In court, I was in court in Corpus Christi, you know, the state couldn't even tell of one case of voter fraud that was done in person voter fraud. And so the, the interesting part is that young people are not participating because I believe young people today are extremely brilliant and they get it. They may not know the words, they may not have the the, the different definitions, and they may not watch C-SPAN around the clock, but they understand that things aren't changing for better. And when the cost of college goes up every year, they get that. And, and, and it's just because nobody is, is paying attention to them, but it's not that they're not voting. Legislators aren't voting for them when they're in Austin, and that's the problem. Students get it. Barack Obama got young people to vote. In fact, he's president because so many young people voted. It's just a matter that you know the legislature and, 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 and I think for yesterday, it's just really having a conversation with young people and treating them as if they, too, are Texans, was there as they, too, the, voters. Was there anything on the table in this election, and this for any of you, was there anything on the table in this election that you thought would engage young people and did or didn't? I mean, was, it didn't seem like that was an audience that anybody was addressing here. Can, can I talk to that, having been head of three statewide youth organizations? Um, a long time ago. A long time ago, but but I, <laughs> maybe not as long as, as yours, Gilberto. Wow. Uh, uh, but also, we, we have we have a youth division, which we've done very well. It has always been the case that young people vote in smaller percentages than other age groups. You can go back and look in the 60s, look at the 70s, look at the 80s, 90s. Nothing. There's nothing new under the sun in politics. For better or worse, young people generally don't vote in as large a percentages as other demographics. It's just... Uh, so it's just a hard fact. Just a hard fact. That's just the facts. People may well, not want to know them, I, but it's just the facts. Can I say something? One of the problems I think it, that students have, have had, you know, <clears throat> it's like working folks. Um, you get up in the morning uh, to, to go to your job early in the morning. You work... Uh, an eight-hour uh, uh, shift, and sometimes more. You come back at the at, in the evening. You're tired. You're you're dealing with your kids. You're dealing with your family. You're trying to make sure that everything is is going all right in 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 your household. And voting doesn't become a priority because at the end of the day, you're not sure whether it really makes a difference. Particularly when you're when you're crowded into districts where no matter what you do, you're not going to be able to change the ultimate outcome of who gets elected, which is a lot what has happened with these redistricting plans that the Republican Party has passed. I mean, they've, they've packed Hispanics into districts where they're or, or where they're not going to they're not going to be able to the Hispanics influence. had to sue the Democrats over the same thing in the 90s. Well, that's right. And they right. and rightfully so and they did the same thing and they won those lawsuits right. and it made a difference at, the, at at a certain point. And I think students are, are are dealing with a very difficult situation today. Tuition rates have increased multiple times um, since the Republicans be, have been in power. They're paying, you know, 4, 5, 6, 8,000 dollars a semester. So you can, order, but, and, but but this but, is to let, my point. But, you can raise tuition like that. You can do yeah, those things well, but, and they still don't vote. Well, but they're dealing with trying to raise the money to pay the tuition, trying to make sure that they're able to get through their classes, having part-time jobs that they're having to deal with, all the things that they're having to deal with, and everything crowds into their schedule, and it really becomes hard for them to prioritize the issue of voting at a certain point, particularly if they don't think it's going to make any difference ultimately in their in what happens in their lives. I mean, they've been living through this for 20 years, you know, and I mean, look, when I went to school, to college, and probably Steve was in the same situation, you know, maybe it was a long time ago, but I could go to school and work a part-time job, and I had enough money to be able to pay my tuition and be able to pay my expenses. Most students, unless they got scholarships or wealthy parents, 
can't do that anymore because it, it is so hard for them. And so they don't prioritize the concept of voting because, and we also don't promote it in this state. It isn't a priority. Everywhere you go, there's obstacles to voting. You got walk into the polling place and there's signs, watch out for voter fraud. Everything is, they're watching over your shoulder like Big Brother thinking that you're going to do something illegal because you're going to cheat in an election. That just doesn't happen. Study after study after study has shown that, that most people won't risk their lives um, in prison uh, to, to, uh, by, uh, to, in order to commit a, uh, uh, a felony in, in, in voter fraud. I, they, people vote because they want to participate you're, in the election You're making process. me scared to vote. Yeah, everybody. I mean, that, I mean that's what you have today. And, it, and people, you go, I mean, you go to vote and people are checking your ID, they're checking everything. Everything's designed to discourage you from voting. And when you discourage people to vote, particularly, look, one of the problems that we have as Hispanics in, 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 in the state of Texas is that we have not developed a culture of voting. African Americans tend to vote at higher numbers because you have a 60 year civil rights movement that focused on the concept of voting. They figured that in the Deep South, they were not going to change people's attitudes, so they were going to empower African Americans by teaching them, registering them, and getting them to go out and vote. And they did that for 60, 70 years. And today, African Americans vote almost at the same percentage as, not, as Anglo voters in, in across America and, and in this state as well. We don't have that culture of voting. Um, and all we have experienced is an attempt to discourage us from voting uh, or attempt to marginalize the effect of our vote. And so people don't participate as a result of that. And so at every stage of the game, there's an obstacle play, placed in front of Hispanic voters, particularly young Hispanic voters, that causes them not to participate. In California, you had a labor movement called the UFW movement that was also a civil rights movement that was designed not only to organize people in, in the area of wages and working conditions for farm workers, but it also engaged them in the electoral process. And what happened in California? California today is a deep, deep blue state because Hispanics vote. So the, so the question in Texas is the Democrats have been in the desert here for 20 years. That's right. And have had these same present problems with and without voter ID laws for 20 years and have not engaged these youth voters. They haven't, I mean, is it just the case, you know, the only time we had a jump, I'll direct this to you, the only time we had a jump was 2008. Mm -hmm. We unexpectedly, we were talking about it a while ago, unexpectedly brought home a presidential primary for, an unsettled presidential primary for the Democratic nomination for president and everybody voted. So what'd you learn? I mean, and why haven't we replicated that? Well, I mean, that's because nobody's talking to young people. And I think something important also to point out is that young people are very different from their parents and grandparents. Of every race, a lot of times you see um, consultants and strategists want to group um, every, every Latino student is, 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 is interested in, in an immigration conversation. They can be compassionate about it and care about it, but it might not impact them directly if they're first generation or second generation or third generation um, Texan, American. Um, and young African-Americans. A lot of students were calling me and telling me that they saw some African-Americans for Wendy Davis signs and pens, and they were just inquiring about what, you know, they didn't get that. And young people are picking these things up. And it's not that it was offensive, but for them, they, it, it was, they considered themselves on the team of, of Wendy Davis in a lot of uh, sense. And so for young people, it's just Barack Obama was having a conversation about the future. He was having a conversation, and, and frankly, he's a younger candidate. Uh, you don't see that a lot. You don't see the promotion of younger candidates unless they're a Bush or a, you know, some child of a, a senator or congressperson. And I think that you know, if there are younger candidates, they might talk about some of the things that impact young people or talk about the 99, but young people are just regular people. They're not going to go vote if nobody's talking about their issues. And, 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 and yesterday showed that a lot of people uh, did felt the same way, and I think looking at the traction from 2008 would be key for what battleground Texas or what could have possibly happened in terms of sustaining a certain demographic of young people that have now started to participate in the process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts on, on 2008? How do you replicate that? Was that just a one-off? 
Well, we looked at female primary voters, and we noticed that over a million female primary voters dropped off the Democrat roll since 2008. Right. And so if you actually look at the 2014 primary numbers, Republican female primary voters represented double what that, that of uh, Democrat female primary voters. So 730,000 versus 360,000 voters. So uh, let me go to audience questions here. We'll um, give them a crack at you guys. Uh, and uh, Ms. Crispin, I'll start with you on this. What's your opinion on same-day voting and how would it impact young votes and women votes in particular? And I'll throw in same-day registration just for laughs. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think that's a difficult one, and I think the devil's in the detail. When we've looked at it in the legislature, um, there are always problems um, that arise with same-day registration. And I think it just makes sense that, um, that uh, we keep the time periods in place. And um, this is something, this is legislation that's popped up session after session after session, and it's just never gotten through. Do you think it would encourage voting? I don't. I don't think it will make a difference. I don't think it will make a difference. Um, they have, people know when elections are coming up, mm -hmm. and I think same-day registration is, um, it just doesn't, it, it's not going to increase voter turnout. Republicans don't want you to vote, and that's the bottom line. The less people participate well, in electoral politics, well, let, let, no, let me I, finish. I, I didn't not, interrupt you. I thought you, were you not finished? No, I'm not finished. Okay, I, I would actually ahead. like to say, you know, I think it's interesting early on that you're talking about young voters turning out. And you said that due to schedules and classes and part-time jobs, that they were actually too busy to vote. So are they too busy to vote and they need same-day registration? I mean, which is it? Every study that has been conducted in states that have same-day reg registration has shown that it increases voter participation substantially. And this whole boogeyman, really the boogeyman here is not Battleground, Texas. The boogeyman that y'all have created is voter fraud. And it doesn't exist. I mean, you know, Greg Abbott spent millions of dollars investigating electoral, uh, election fraud all across the state of Texas. And I think he ended up prosecuting three people for a three-year period. It doesn't exist. It is not there. They, they raise all these obstacles because they don't want people to participate in voting. We, we, let me give you an example of what happened in the last, legisla last legislative session. In Arizona, you can register to vote online. The governor of Arizona is, guess what? A right-wing Republican, right? She signed that legislation allowing online registration. Makes it easier for everybody. You can just get online. If you're not registered, everybody has a computer and register to vote. We proposed that in this last legislative session, and the Republican Party said, no, we don't want to do this. The people that were on the committees that were involved in elections, we don't want to do this, and they raised all sorts of questions that there might be some fraud involved. There has been no cases of fraud in Arizona since they've been, um, uh, they implemented it, and more people register. If more people register, more people vote. I mean, this is what we see time and time and time again. Everything that people that increases the participation of voters at the polling places at, at election time, this is a democracy. Gosh, you know, the more people vote, the more people decide who are their leaders. And if you vote and and you decide who you are going to, who's going to uh, uh, decide your future then you should be proud of that. You sh this is why we have these wars that we fight in and we, and we uh, send our soldiers to, to put their lives on the line because we have a democracy that we're trying to protect. And the way you make your democracy better is you have more people participate in. Why are people afraid of that? What's wrong with that? Well, let me address voter fraud because I've, I've unfortunately well, let's do let's do same day voting first. Well, that's to me that's tied to it. I mean, I personally would be in favor of same day registration if you could convince me that we are not increasing voter fraud. But I, but I am I am very personally uh, tied to this issue because I worked in a race that I'm absolutely convinced was stolen, um, and I I can give you some other. Uh, now, you can laugh, but you don't know. You weren't there. You don't know. Uh, you, you think, do you think voter fraud is funny? Do you think if a race is stolen that that's funny? And by the way, we're all up here as guests. If you could have be polite to the people up here, it would be appreciated. Thank you, sir. But I worked in Ron Paul's congressional campaign when I think that race was absolutely stolen. And I'll tell you how I believe, why I believe it's stolen and why it's affected my view on why we need to be careful about voter fraud. He supposedly lost to Bob Gamage by a couple hundred votes. 
uh, when he was running for re-election. And so his campaign decided to send out thank you notes to everybody that voted, that supposedly had just voted. When they sent this out, thousands of letters came back of people who supposedly were alive, real people that said, deceased, no such address, etc. So as a student, I worked over my Christmas holidays, going door to door with the list of people that supposedly voted with the returned addresses. And I have personally seen vacant lots. I have personally talked to people that said that person hasn't been here in seven, eight years. I went to places where there were gas stations that supposedly vote. I've seen this with my own eyes. And unless you have personally investigated that, you don't know. I think it's terrible that that happened. There were more documented cases of people that turned out to be fraudulent than the margin of victory that was brought to court. The court said, we don't have any jurisdiction. Courts can't decide. This can only be decided by the House of Representatives. Every Democrat voted for the Democrat. Every Republican voted for the Republican. I am convinced that election was stolen and that Ron Paul should have been reelected. And that, in, from that point on, I said, I will do everything I can to make sure that doesn't happen again. I'll give you another example. I was down in Nueces County. I was talking to the county chairman, Mike Bergsma. He said, you know, a couple elections ago, a bus pulled up, people came out, and one of the people had seven voter registration cards. And he asked Mike, people asked for specific examples, this specific example. Y'all can talk to Mike Bergsma. And he said, the guy said, which one do I use at this location? I've been told to go to different locations. <laughs> I will tell you another example. I worked as part of the legal team in Ohio for Bush in 2004, and they did a similar thing. They sent out letters to everybody that was supposedly registered to vote, and thousands came back with the wrong person, wrong address. So I personally think that all of us should be able to agree that if there is any, if there is any voter fraud, we should wipe it out. Uh, and that's what this is about. Is there, is there a danger of this whole sort of the voter ID argument and the argument over harvesting absentee ballots and all of these, all of these voter arguments? Don't all of these have the effect of telling everybody, I'm just not going to mess with voting. I'm just not going to play. Right. That's exactly ha what happens. How, how hard exactly, is it? That's exactly what happens, okay. though, is people get discouraged from voting. Look, I mean, one of the, one of the, what I mean, easier, I'm, I'm, what about, easier, I'm actually talking about people on both sides. <clears throat> what easier way is there? To, vo to commit voter fraud than through vote-by-mail programs. I mean, but, but I think really I easy, easy to do that. But every time, you don't see the Republicans trying to impose strict restrictions on how you do that. Why? Because they got a great system of, 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 of vote-by-mail programs, and they, they register to vote so many hundreds of thousands of people who don't even live in Texas. They come and they, they, they stay in these large mobile home parks. They live in Iowa and Kansas and everywhere else, but they come a few months out of the year. They register them to vote as, as Texans, and they get them to vote by, uh, vote, uh, vote by mail. You know, I mean, you can't get the Republicans to want to enforce anything on that. Why? Because they're taking full advantage of that law and they're getting their votes out there. It's only, only when there's laws that will increase voter turnout among people that are naturally Democratic constituents that they jump in there and say, oh, voter fraud, we got to be careful. You know, they don't say, they say, well, who is, is anybody here for voter fraud? Well, why don't you ask the question, is anybody here for disenfranchising even one voter in Texas? And can I, I just, either side, either way, I mean, there's no excuse for not participating in elections. I mean, yes, I'm going to say that the, the bill was wrong and it, it didn't let students vote with their, their student ID. Students were turned away yesterday, but it let you use a gun license. There was a cherry picking that happened of what type of ID. That was wrong, but we can't make excuses for why people are not participating in elections. We cannot make excuses and we cannot accept excuses. Online registration was key, and if there is a problem with, with voting and harvesting, I can, I can check my bank account. I can probably buy a house, something in a foreign land with my cell phone. Technology. We have got to move forward. 50 years ago, next year, LBJ signed, President LBJ signed the Voting Rights Act. Dr. King died. A lot of people struggle. We're talking about the same things in 2014. 
In China, little kids are speaking Mandarin and English in kindergarten. We've got serious economic things that we've got to figure out as a generation about the next 40 years. And if the legislature's emergency legislation is voter ID, we have a problem. We need young people running for office. We need young people organizing other young people and getting the agenda together in Austin. Do you guys, I, I, I just want to go down to the table sort of a yes, no. Do you think that the people who don't vote, who are eligible to vote, would vote the same way as the people who do vote? Would we get the same results in the election yesterday if everybody eligible to vote, no fraud, voted? Would we get the same results? Yeah. No. So you think that the non-voters would vote differently from the voters? I believe so. I believe that that's what you've seen when people when you have a larger voter participation. Ms. Christmas. So can you repeat that question? If the non-voters yeah, if the vote eligible today? eligible voters in Texas, if every if we had a hundred percent turnout. Would we get the same I results? I believe Texas would remain red. Same numbers? Mm -hmm. same well, we know from polling that when the pollsters poll, they do models of, of likely voters, but they call all the registered voters. So mm -hmm. we do know what those results are, and those results are still overwhelmingly Republican. Now, could it change something on the margin? Could it be that there's a correlation between people that don't vote that are either Republican or Democrat? Perhaps it could. It could probably be a few percentage points, but nothing that would make up for the huge margins we've been winning by consistently for 20 years. But that's not what they poll. They poll, they poll likely voters. They poll that's the poll they, and they, then they filter for Right, they yeah. filter, but they right. do poll the, all yeah. the voters that are registered. But the numbers with. you see are the likely voters. Yeah, but you can look at the cross tabs and find out the No, the results would not be the same. You think they'd be? I think they would be different. Okay. So tell me why those non-voters don't vote. And this gets back to you know, sort of where we, where we wanted to start was, you know, we're talking about youth voters. But we're talking about non-voters, and we're talking about, you know, if you got everybody to vote who could vote without fraud, okay, just stipulate, just a magic wand, Harry Potter, um, why wouldn't you? And how do you get them to vote? I mean, obviously, most Texans are saying, I don't want to do that. Start over there. Well, I, I think that, you know, when there's an energy and a momentum, when it's beyond the rhetoric, when people see that elections are talking about them, when they feel like they have something at stake. Everybody's not motivated by fear. In fact, fear turns a lot of people who don't vote or the lower propensity voters, they don't vote because they're not going to be, you know, scared into voting. They don't want to be a part of that. They vote when they're energized, which is why Barack Obama was so successful. Do you think this year's candidates blew it? I think that talking about scandals more than talking about, you know, pre-K and, and future of the economy, yes, absolutely. Both sides? Both sides, but I think I, th I don't think that the you know conservatives even they, they were they were targeted. I mean they were specific as to what they wanted to do, but did, did the Democrats properly address those voters? No, absolutely not. There was no authentic conversations on anything. And I think part of that may have been because um, Senator Davis was from the legislature, and and that that may have been a you know there maybe maybe you know I don't know, but um, ultimately no. no, there were not real conversations that. If you're gonna throw mud, throw mud about like you know the the 99 percent that that are in Texas. Mr. Minister, you agree with that? Well, I think there's two reasons why Texans don't vote. The first is if 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 you know uh, if Florida State is paying playing rice, <laughs> you pretty well know what the outcome is going to be. So it is it's true that you have lower turnouts. Do you think there's fraud in that? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I want to check the idea of every football player. Um, but I, in states where the, the states are not competitive, you have lower turnout. So what state has been the least competitive state in the United States? Well, there's only one state where the Republican Party has won every statewide election for 20 years, and that's here in Texas. So this is the least competitive state, so you would expect turnout to be lower here. The other reason people generally get fired up to turn out is if they're mad about something and if they're unhappy with the overall environment. And Texas's economy in 2012 grew at 7.6 percent. It grew at 3.8 percent last year. We're lower than the national unemployment rate. If you drive around Austin, Dallas, San Antonio, Houston, there are cranes everywhere. So if people are generally happy with the economy, they don't turn out to vote as much either. If we were in the midst of a terrible recession, if, our, if, the, if the government was issuing IOUs, I bet our participation rates would go up. Ms. Crispin, do you think the candidates addressed 
No, I, I, you know, I, I definitely don't on the Democrat side, and I would agree with you that there has to be an authentic conversation. I think that's what's missing. And when we continue to attack each other for um, things that are based on gender or based on race, um, a lot of folks will turn a deaf ear. They don't want to hear it anymore. And it goes back to having that genuine conversation from genuine leaders about a vision for Texas. I think that Greg Abbott did a phenomenal job at laying out his bicentennial plan for the state of Texas. And, um, and he put together a serious plan where people could access it, read it, and understand it. And then even have, you know, through his Google chats and t teletown halls, ask him questions about his plan. I don't think we saw that from the other side. I think that was the major missing component and folks were never able to really truly understand what Wendy Davis stood for other than, you know, serving as a poster child for late-term abortions. And I think that was all that we heard from her other than these low-blow attacks that she continued to launch against Greg Abbott. And he just forged ahead talking about the positive vision he had for our state. And I think that truly was the difference. Let, let me just back. say this. I mean, uh, uh, I think I find a difficult time understanding how someone can say that we're talking about wedge issues when the Republican Party spent, the Republican leadership spent millions of dollars in calling two special sessions to pass the most, the strictest anti-choice law in the entire nation uh, in the last legislative session, and they and they talk that w they're talking about we spending too much time on wedge issues. Come on, give me a break. But let me, the one thing that I will agree with Republicans on today. Uh, today is this. It's a one-time offer. And, 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 and I don't know that the rest of the party necessarily agrees with me on this, but, but I believe this. And I think that ultimately this is how we end up turning the state blue. For the last 25 years after Ann lost, um, we decided that the only way we were going to turn the state blue is by bringing back those moderate, uh, those conservative Democrats that went over to the Republican Party and those independents that were voting consistently for the Republican Party, bringing them back into the Democratic uh, uh, fold. And that's how we would win. Um, and what we learn in election after election after election after election is that's not going to happen. They're over there, and they're over there to stay. We'd love for them to come, but I don't believe they are going to come. And I've been advocating for a long time is that you don't excite the base until you start talking to the base. And you start talking to the base about the issues that are important. Um, and you don't worry about alienating or not alienating, you know, those folks that left the party a long time ago because you're, you, you're giving people a reason to participate in the electoral process. So, something like what Elizabeth Warren is doing right now all across America and talking a populist uh, uh, tone about why the middle class is not uh, getting the benefits of anything that's happening in, in, the, in the economy today and why we're, we're, we're going back instead of going forward like we were supposed to go and we learned that we were supposed to go. I believe, and, and I wish more Democratic candidates did this in Texas, and I think that if we spent more time doing this, we'd have different results. If we, if we went out there and just tell it like it is, talked about the issues that are important to the base, and not worry about alienating anybody, we would see a lot more people involved in the electoral process. What happened in 2008 is the reason why you had more people participating in that election is Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton in Texas were talking about the issues that were important to Texans. They didn't hold back. They were talking to primary voters that they wanted to bring over to their side. So all the issues that were important to base voters at that time were being heard by those two candidates during that election, and you had a big surge of participation. That election was over. We, went, we had our presidential election. By the way, Barack Obama got more votes than, than a lot of people thought he was going to be able to get in Texas at that time because at that time, that's who he was talking to. We haven't done that, okay. and we need to change that, in my opinion. And I think when we start doing that, that's when you, students and, and Hispanics and African Americans and women who are trying to, single women who are trying to make it every single day uh, uh, with uh, a, a, a difficult economy uh, will start participating more in, the, in elections. This is an anonymous audience question um, for the chairman. Congress is polarized and trust is declining. Could nonpartisan state and national elections thrive? It arguably works at the local level, or would a bunch of independents piss off James Madison? <laughs> Uh, do we need factions to maintain a healthy national discourse? 
Well, first, because we have a First Amendment and a right of association, you can't prevent political parties, so therefore you're going to have political parties. So the question then becomes, do you have what you have in Louisiana, which is a jungle primary, which is you don't separate out the two parties. You still have parties, but they put all their— All the candidates all the candidates. The time, right? And I would just say it, it's, it's like any alternative. There, there are pros to it and cons to it. It's just like, should we have uh, nonpartisan judicial elections? Uh, there are pros to it and there are cons to it. So it, it doesn't solve the problem if you think parties are a problem. It doesn't solve the party problem of parties because they're still going to be parties. And you can't prevent parties. They're private organizations. I mean, there was different political parties in the uh, before the year uh, 2011 or 2010 when the Tea Party went into 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 office in Congress, and they worked together. You know, Speaker uh, O'Neill would sit down and have a beer with Ronald Reagan, and they'd work out their differences, and they'd put together a policy that benefited all Americans, and they didn't worry about whether it was a Democratic or Republican <coughs> policy. Uh, I, I, that, I mean, there was two different political parties, but they understood that when you get elected to Congress, you don't get elected because you're a Democrat or a Republican. You get elected to serve the people that you're supposed to serve, in you, not just your district, but in, in the United States of America. And we've kind of lost sight of that. And that's why we're having problems. People forgot why they got elected. Uh, they didn't. They got elected to try to figure out solutions to problems that are facing all Americans, not to to sit there and espouse policies that are just uh, the policies of the particular narrow group of people that elected you to office. And that's why we've got a problem. And until that changes, you're going to continue to have stale, uh, a stalemate in, in Congress. Do conversations like this and the tone of conversations like this encourage people to vote or make them run away from politics? Well, I, I think we've seen a very interesting phenomenon over the last several election cycles. Um, I used to think negative ads worked, and we would hear for years people complaining, we hate the negativity, we hate negative ads, and yet the candidate that ran the negative ads always seemed to win. Now, that seems to have been changing the last couple cycles, especially in Texas. I mean, Dewhurst did a lot of negative ads against Cruz. It didn't work. This campaign, I think one of the mistakes the Wendy Davis campaign made is she was negative early without a introductory ad and there were so many negative ads I think that really hurt them. So I'm I'm beginning to change my mind. I used to say, yeah, y'all say you don't want negative ads, but when you <laughs> you vote with the negative ads. But I'm beginning to think that's changing. I think I think people are fed up with both parties. I think people are fed up with gridlock. I think the average American is not ideolo ideological. How many students are at UT today? 45,000, 44,000? Yet how many people show up to a dialogue about the elections? How many folks are here? A hundred? So my point being is that the vast majority of people are not liberal or conservative ideologues. The vast majority of people just want government to function. But ideologues in both parties, conservative ideologues in the Republican Party, liberal ideologues in the Democratic Party, pick candidates that then have ideological agendas as the primary goal. But I think most Americans don't really care about that. I don't partic they'll pick a particular issue. But most Americans just want the economy to go well. They want their educational system to be good. They want to have their potholes filled. And they don't really want to see the parties bickering. And I think that um, both parties are at fault. And both parties can be the solution. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping, for example, with the Republican Senate, that at the very least the President and the Senate can try to get together on foreign policy. Because when I was growing up, we would fight about domestic stuff. But when the United States' interests were threatened abroad, Democrats and Republicans put their differences aside and worked on that. And I'm, I'm hoping that there's some issues coming up we can do that, because I think the public is fed up with both of us. Ms. Sanders? To the young people in the audience, Work really hard, study really hard, watch everything. It's time for young people to start running for office. It is really time for young people. It, it's time for a whole new, new, new Congress, honestly. I mean, it, it, it's a shame. In 20, I was going to say 2011. <laughs> In 2014, we're babysitting representatives that we pay. We're babysitting representatives that we pay. We shouldn't be begging people to do their job. That's not the American way. That's not how this works. 
And I, I mean, negative ads, non-negative ads, I think we've got to get away from the notion of starting with the campaign and start with the people, which means we've got to start with ourselves. And we've got to really start thinking about seriously what we want and how we want it to look. What is the, the Texas we see in 40 years? Because you have to build that today. Legislators in Austin are not interested in doing that, which means we need you know, a different conversation. Realignment happens all the time. I honestly think the Tea Party is frustrated with the Republican Party, and they want to leave, too. It's a, you know, a long-term hissy fit, right? But you also see... <laughs> by the Democrats not learning the lessons of what's happening in, in the Republican Party, because they're just trying to cover it up and make sure nobody really knows that it's, it's a fire. Um, but you're going to see people that are pulling off away from the Democratic Party as well, because at the end of the day, people care about what's happening to them, and they want to be a part of something larger. And I think that that's where we're lost. We start with the campaigns and the parties. There could be a realignment happening over the next 15 years of one of the major parties. It's happened a lot of times since 1786. And, and I think that the key thing is not about the party. It's about the position we're taking and the position we're putting our state and our country in for the next 40 years. Ms. Crispin. I think this dialogue is absolutely important. I will tell you, um, I made sure my daughter, she's a sophomore at Texas Tech University, and I made sure she was watching, and hopefully she has friends watching as well. But I think it's important, particularly from our uh, organization standpoint, that uh, we encourage younger women to not only be active and vote, but also <coughs> see themselves running for office. And we want to make sure that we're here as a resource for them. And we think it's important, you know, if you look at women um, as they progress and, um, and, you know, whether they have a career and they're climbing the corporate ladder or they're at home raising a family or doing both, that running for office is attainable and it's necessary that we have women. If we don't have more women being a part of the process and being in elected office, then our political process is incomplete. And I would also encourage women watching today to take notice of the women that are in office. We have phenomenal women at the top of the ticket um, in both appointed and elected positions. We have two state Supreme Court justices. The first Hispanic woman on the Supreme Court justice, Eva Guzman, and the Deborah Learman as well. And then we also have Christy Craddock, railroad commissioner. We have um, Hope Andrade, the Texas workforce commissioner. We have Nandita Berry, the Secretary of State. I mean, these are women who are in charge and changing things for our state. So I would encourage women watching today to take notice of them, follow in their footsteps. They have blazed a trail for us, and they continue to do amazing things for our state. And so I would just encourage um, women listening today um, to take notice of them. What do you think conversations like this encourage people to vote or make them go out on any part of that? Well, I mean, you got to talk about this. There, I think the people have to hold um, the leadership of this state uh, accountable. Um, of course, conversations like this are important, but I think it's a conversation you all have to have. Everybody has to have and on an ongoing basis. And, and I, 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 I believe that we have an obligation to guilt trip the hell out of all these people that are not voting and tell them that what they're doing is a disservice to their community. I mean, I, I, I I know that the reason that uh, Texas uh, is uh, a red state is because Hispanics don't vote. I believe that. I believe that completely. And every day I get a chance, I say, you know, one of the things that um, um, you hear all the time in my community of, of Hispanics in South Texas is there's a saying that says, la herencia más grande que le pueda dejar a nuestros hijos es una buena educación. The biggest inheritance that you can leave your children is a good education. And, and, and I say, well, what kind of inheritance are you leaving your children if the people who decide the quality of education for your children are elected officials and you don't vote? You know, uh, and you need to look at yourself in the mirror uh, when you just don't take the time to go out and vote, but your family is being deeply affected by policies that cut um, the public school budget by five and a half billion dollars at a time when Hispanic children are the, 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 the majority of school children in the public school system, or when the governor of the state of Texas rejects a hundred billion dollars of expanded Medicaid coverage that will provide uh, health care coverage to 1.2 people, 1.2 million people in the state of Texas, most of which are Hispanic in the state of Texas, or when you make it almost impossible for middle class families to be able to send their children to, uh, to college because the tuition rates are so high. Um, all of this is happening 
because you're not participating and the person that gets affected the most is you and your family. And so I think that's, that's the conversation that needs to be had. You know, we're, y'all are voters. Every person in this room is a voter. I don't have to convince y'all about the importance of going out to vote. It's not you who are a problem. It's the people that are not in this room that are not voting that is a problem. And that's the, per- the people that we have to have the conversation with. However you have it, whether you guilt trip them, you scare them, you, uh, you, you, you give them a patriotic reason for participating, they have to understand that voting is, 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 is an obligation and that there, there, there is nothing more that affects their families than, than the electoral process. Okay, well, let's wrap it there. Give me a hand.